What a lovely time of worship. Thank you, Wendy and the band. It's just a blessing every single week. We are just um, so grateful for you. Yes. Every single week. All right. Um, thanks to Teresa for these amazing slides again. Radio, you are a marathon runner. I don't know. Put your hand up if you're a runner. You're a runner. Oh, wow. I've got some surprising hands up here. Didn't know that. I won't <laughs> tell. Right, that's amazing. All of us, though, are marathon runners. We're not sprinters. We might sometimes do a little sprint, but we are marathon runners. And I'm going to chat with us today about what that means and why you don't have to all have that look on your face that goes, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> you are. Okay, our reading today begins in the book of Luke. Um, so I'm in sync with David with communion today, I notice. Um, we'll be looking at an early episode in Jesus' life here. Uh, it's, it's, it's a common passage, but I've tried to pick up a few lessons to learn for a new year out of this passage. Uh, Luke 2, 22 to 40, and Jesus is just over a month old. So he's about to be dedicated, as we would call it today. Purification back then. Verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus... To do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel." The child's father and mother marvelled at was what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Wonderful passage. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this pas passage um, in your word and I pray that um, as I speak about it and share my thoughts on it, Lord, that your anointing would go with it that as we hear these words, Lord, that something in our hearts would jump, that we would know, Lord, that your, your word is destined to change our life too, Lord, that as we follow you, Lord, all things can happen, any things can happen, and you are with us graciously. I thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Okay. So what has two old people in a church... In Jerusalem got to do with being a marathon runner we'll figure this out the passage of scripture does begin with Joseph and Mary and they are as I called it dedicating their 40 day year old 
baby in church because that was the, the, the number of days before you took that firstborn male and consecrated them, 40 days. So we know Jesus was that old. And what happens during this church service, I believe when you look into it, gives us some wonderful examples of how we are also to live our Christian life. I believe that um, in every area of life, it's not how we start a race. It's not how we start our marathon, which as you'll see, obviously I'm talking about our walk with God. It's always how we finish it. Christian life, as I said earlier, is not a sprint. It is a marathon, as we all know. You might have had a terrible start. I don't know your stories, all of you at all. You might, have had a ter- you might have had a wonderful start. You might have had a little bit of a disappointing middle bit. You might have had a really tough, tough middle bit. And you might be in a tough finish. Or you might be in a joyful, light-hearted finish. But wherever you are, your ending and how you end is what's going to count. The past is not my story. Thank goodness. (laughs) Hallelujah. God wants me to look to him for a glorious finish. The Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's 2 Timothy 4, 7. Wow. In our own strength, to me, that sounds incredibly lofty. (laughs) Like, I have fought the good fight. Can you imagine... Me in all, you know, humility, standing up here before you and going, guess what, guys, I've fought the good fight. i finished the race. I've kept the faith. It's lofty. Have I? Have I actually? I don't know. I'd like to say so. But Paul is reminding us that it's possible. It is possible. Anybody here ever heard of Melitza Machiva? All right. Spoiler alert. Melitza Machiva was the first Bulgarian woman to run in an Olympics marathon. And she has some really good advice, which I don't know if Melitza is a born-again Christian or, or where her faith is. Um, she might be, I'm not sure. Um, but humanly speaking, she has written a lot of motivational books and she's got a lot to say on um, the topic of running your race. I've read some of it, Um, but she has this advice for staying the course, and I've popped it into a little nutshell. I'm not going to spend very long on it, but I think these are great things that Melitza says, good pointers that we can weave into our spiritual life. Number one is set yourself a goal. So we're starting off in 2023. If you haven't already given yourself a goal, set yourself one. I know that a lot of naysayers will say, ah, yeah, goals are made to be broken, I get to March and I've completely lost the plot. Well, you don't have to. You can set yourself achievable goals, and that's a whole nother topic. Um, But if you don't set a goal, you won't hit it. You need a target out in a field that you can hit before you can hit it. Otherwise, you're just blindly chucking arrows around and hoping it's going to hit the target. Give yourself a goal. Number two, realise there are always steep inclines and rocky patches. It is never going to be an easy, slow-moving journey through a meadow. Wouldn't that be every marathon runner's dream? Marathon runners, my son-in-law is one, and my daughter is one. My son-in-law has had goals to run marathons in every major event in the world, which he just got to Boston last year, and that was the ultimate. Um, you have to do an ultra, ultra marathon or something to, in a certain amount of time to get there. And, he, after years of not quite making it, he made it. He got into the top whatever it was and he got there. And that was just a pinnacle for him. But he's been Japan, he's been go- everywhere. Um, and, and, and so he would tell you, you've got to work with the steep inclines. You've got to know that there's going to be rocky patches ahead. They have not set the course to be a walk in the park. That's not what it's about. You're training for the rocky places. You're training for the steep inclines so you need to expect them and when you can expect them you can then work with them a little bit better they don't blindside you quite as much because you knew they were coming you spotted them and you've known you've practiced for them three set and run to your own pace 
You will see others passing by, she says, and they may crash and burn, and they may frighten you as they whiz past you in the early stages. But the race is never about how fast you started, she says, it's all about the finish and how you finish. Four, I thought this is a beauty, pick the right tunes. The soundtrack you listen to can make you or break you. And m my son has told us the sort of things that he does. He does numbers and all kinds of things, but what he does, but he says, you get the wrong, the wrong music or the wrong thing in your head and you, you'll be thrown. You'll be thrown. You need to get the right tune. Number five, pick a buddy to run with or ask someone to commit to cheer you on in the difficult places. Our daughter doesn't even start the race watching him. She moves around the course to where she knows the harder part is and she positions herself and she waits for him and she sits there and when he comes around the corner, she sees him, probably not a flash by then, but she sees him and she's there yelling for him. And as he comes around that tough part, he hears his wife and he feels encouraged. They've talked to us about this. They have what they call pacers, um, if you're not familiar with marathon running. And the pacer sets the pace for you and with you. Sometimes they'll run beside you if that's what you want, but other times the best thing for them to do is just to run ahead of you a bit. And um, our son-in-law has been a pacer for many people. And he says, it's a great feeling. He said, when I haven't set myself up with a pacer, I choose one. I find someone in the crowd that I know is going to make it to the end ahead of me. I see them, I spot them, I watch their cap or their shirt number, and I go with them to the end. Get a pacer or a buddy to go with you. Make sure you are carb loading. Uh, um, OK, it's in there. I had to read it. I'm pretty sure she's talking about pizza and potato cakes and things like that, but um, I, I think we can take this as God's word for, look, carb, I'm, I'm stretching it, sorry Melissa, but I'm really stretching it here, but carb loading on the Bible, right? Can't we do that? Yeah, that's, that's my energy source, so load up on it, soak up the word of God. Bread. Hey? Bread. It's bread, the bread of life. Thank you, John. That's why it's called daily bread. Oh, wow, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> This is good, this is good. Okay, uh, so go for it. Pizza, cake, bread, daily bread. All right, seven, don't forget to rest up. Everyone needs regular rest days and you should never, ever, ever feel guilty about them. Preparing for a marathon will always require hard and tedious workouts, but it's the resting of your body in between times that refreshes and ultimately allows you to finish that big race. There's some excellent advice in there. And every year, as I said, most of us take some stock of what went right last year and what we need to refocus on for the next year. Out of this passage of scripture, I am coming back to Luke. I see three things that are going to help us go the distance in our Christian walk slash marathon. Three habits, if you like, that we're going to cultivate, which will enable us to see our race right through to the end. And the first one is Holy Spirit-led trust. This is a big one. If we haven't got trust in the Holy Spirit and in the Lord, what have we got? That's our everything. That's our hope, is our trust in God. As they head off to the temple to dedicate baby Jesus... Unknown to Mary and Joseph, someone is anticipating their arrival. This man, he didn't know they were coming that particular day, perhaps. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I imagine that he knew when he saw Jesus. That's the feel you get when you read that passage. The man was Simeon. He was a godly Jewish man. The scripture says he had the Holy Spirit on him. And by that same spirit, he had received a promise from God. Some of you are holding on to a promise from God about an issue in your life, in your family. God knows. Hold on to it. Keep holding on to it, okay? Because God promised Simeon. He said, Simeon, you're not going to die before you see the Messiah come. 
The older Simeon got, I think, the more he might have been getting discouraged. Every day I'm going to the temple, I'm doing... Is the Messiah going to even be at the temple? I don't know, but God says, go to the temple. I'm going to the temple. He keeps going. And the day that Mary and Joseph arrive at the temple and they dedicate the Lord, Simeon is weeping tears of joy as he steps forward and takes that baby Jesus into his arms and praises God, saying this, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. He's crying tears of joy, and basically he's saying, you can kill me now. (laughs) I can go. You can do what you like with me because I'm done. I can die happy, is what he's saying, because you, O Lord, kept your promises to me. I love that about that man. I just love it. It underlines to me that first spiritual habit that's going to help us to go the distance. If you're not sure what God has promised you, or you don't know if he even has, or you're questioning what you believe to be a promise, what do you do with that? You can start by reading the Word of God. Soak yourself in it. Pick up the Bible. It's full of promises about God's love, about his keeping power. Promises and many blessings. If Hugo was here, he would say, what would he say? Double blessings, double blessings, quadruple blessings. Sorry, it's an in-joke. Hugo was a a gentleman who left our fellowship shortly for all those who don't know Hugo. And he used to say, blessings, sister, blessings, double blessings. I'm trying, I'm doing the accent, that's terrible. (laughs) Sorry, Hugo. (laughs) Quadruple blessings. Okay, but that's what God does and his Bible is full of his promises. And we hold fast to it. Hebrews 10 tells us to hold fast. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And I think the most important part of all of this is no matter what happens, you and I are still good, God. We're okay. You and I are still good. I still trust you. This doesn't mean, oh, you've promised me this and you've promised me that. You promised me a ranch in Texas and um, that must be coming to me one day. I'm hanging on to that. Whatever happens, whether I live in a caravan... <clears throat> Incidentally, we are. Um, You know, am I living in a caravan or am I in a ranch in Texas as God promised? But the main thing is I trust him. I never let go of that trust because he and I are good. He's a good God and I know he's good. That makes anything that happens in my life bearable because I trust you, God. At the end of the day, you are faithful And that's what Hebrews 10 tells us. So Simeon has held on to his promise. He's lived his life a long time believing. I think he probably built his life on that fact because he's showed up to the temple every single day and he's been praying and waiting for the salvation of Israel. If you can build that habit of trusting God's promises into your life, I believe that you will go a long way towards finishing your marathon with the same joy Simeon had that day. Alongside that first habit goes very closely habit number two, which is Holy Spirit-led obedience. Let's look at the word that says that how Simeon got to come to the temple that day. If you have a look at that, um, I don't know if I put the scripture up there or not. Yeah, there you go. How did he get to be in the temple that day? He was moved by the Spirit and he came. From all accounts, he was getting older. Theologians do disagree on that point, but most of them believe he was an old man. Have you ever felt strongly that God was urging you to get up, get dressed and go to church without looking at anyone in particular? So now I have to put my eyes down. Someone said to me this morning, I knew I had to be here today. I had to be here today. I love that. Sometimes when we're weary or we might have had a big weekend or day before and we're so tired and we're not even 100% 
well in ourselves that God moves us to go to church. That's been moved by the Spirit. I was supposed to be in church today. I get that urging. I get that feeling. Several times I walk away from here and say, I was supposed to be in church today. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. That's how it works. He speaks, we obey. That's how it's supposed to work. As a result, though, Simeon got to hold in his own very arms and hands the baby who was going to hold the whole world in his hands. Simeon got to hold him. He got to see it. We'll pick up the story back in verse 36. And now a lady, an elderly lady, called Anna appears. Oh, I've got more of that for you coming. Look at, who have we got there? Oh my goodness, Joy. Do you see the little fine print, Joy, where it says, we love you, Joy? Joy, stand up so everyone knows what this slide is about. Eight, 85, right? 85? We, do we never tell it? 86. <laughs> Nearly 87. We never tell a lady's age, but I just did, so sorry, forgive me. Anna is getting old. We're told that she has been a widow for 84 years. And here she is, elderly and very active in her church. We are told that she is found worshipping there. So she's fine to put her hands up and do a little hop, skip and a jump. And she's praying night and day. How many know that old age is nothing in God's kingdom, guys? Old age is nothing in God's kingdom. Old age is never a reason to stop loving, caring, being beautiful, being your beautiful you, spreading encouragement around the place. Um, I don't think we ever retire from, from our... We do from our chosen career, but we don't in God, do we? We never want to retire from blessing others and running our race, encouraging people. A, a little while ago, someone visited here, um, and this was said to me in the kindest of ways. It really was. Um, but the comment said to me, you seem to have a lot of elderly people in your church. <laughs> It was said very not well. I can't remember my exact words, but I answered something like, well, what I've noticed is we have a lot of caring, beautiful, active, dedicated, faithful people in our church with servants' hearts that turn up to every event, put everything together and pack it away, no matter what time of night it is. They all go home together having packed it away. That's what I've noticed about our church. I, I did answer something like that. And yes, you're right, many happen to have grey hair. <laughs> if you call that elderly, bring it on. <laughs> right? Okay, our third habit to cultivate in 2023. Holy Spirit-led perseverance. Adding to the habits of trusting and obeying, we now come to perseverance, which you need for a marathon. You can't do it without it. It's such an obvious point, but Unless you, you'll never reach the end of the track unless you go around it, right? <laughs> you can't get to the end unless you keep going around it. You can't just plonk yourself down in the middle and go, ah, I'm done. That's me. No, Anna had been around and around and around the track many times. She lost her husband just seven years after they were married. Maybe the Bible doesn't actually tell us that either, but maybe she was a very young woman at that time. 84 years are on and she's still serving. So she may well have been in her 90s or hundreds. I think I looked it up. Jeff might be able to tell me this. I think I looked it up and she was said to have died at around 120. And Simeon won 30. I looked that up and I, they, they disagree on a few things so I'm not going to try to go there too much. Anyway, she was old. <laughs> Despite her age... She was that ever-ready bunny that just kept going and going and going and going and going around the track. Not just out of duty, guys. She had joy. And that's what kept her going. That was her energy source, joy. Joy in serving God. Despite her age, maybe indeed because of her age, she persevered. 
wouldn't that be great to be said of you as you are getting older and as we are all growing older is because of her age she persevered. I'd love that. Maybe you can put that on my tombstone, John. <laughs> Gasp. Okay. Let's skip that little bit. Okay, Psalm 121, I'll go to. Yep. Um, Psalm 121 tells us, I will look to the hills from whence comes my help. So when we do go through those hard, difficult, rocky times, those curved balls that life will throw at us, where do we look, guys? We look to the hills because that's looking to the Lord, to Jesus, from where comes my help. You could repeat that to yourself on a daily basis basis i will look to the hills from where my help comes from what a great soundtrack that would be to run to right okay i love that anna in her old age has decided to put herself in church that's where she's decided to be not just to worship god but certainly that's what was bringing her a lot of joy but to be at the right place at the right time to give encouragement to the weary and to the seekers and to anyone else who finds their, their way into the temple that she was serving in. I just love it. And firstly, you'll notice that she got alongside Simeon as he was joyfully exclaiming over the Christ, the Messiah that he recognised. She got alongside him with, her, with his joy and built her joy into it as well. And then she brought a word of encouragement to Mary and Joseph as they were about to head off on their travels. Never underestimate your ability to bring refreshment to another soul by a thoughtful and encouraging word. We can be any age to do that, right? We can be younger than these guys sitting up here at the front. I won't go the older scale. I'll just leave that with you. But you can be any age to do this. Your wisdom, your positive words can spur on another marathon runner. Maybe they were just about to give up and they came across you, Anna, who just got alongside them with all their energy and said, keep going. Paste it, paste it with you and said, keep going. Can you, I, I often think Mary and Joseph, you know, they left, they had the baby dedication, they had the prophecies, they realised, wow, that was a special word about Jesus being the deliverer of Israel we thought but it's been confirmed now by these prophets and then they go back on their road back to Nazareth and they're traveling and I can just imagine Mary over the years saying Joseph do you remember what that old lady said do you remember what was her name I can't remember her name but remember what she said and he would go over it with her and go yes Jesus is the deliverer they would have reminded themselves of words like that. You can be that person for somebody else on their journey. You can give that kind of hope to people. Ever feel like giving up? I've been there. Feeling weary and tired? I've been there. Anxious, hassled, exhausted, emotional? I've been there too. I know we have, we all have. But my experience is that when I need more energy, when I need more joy, the best thing to do is to start spreading it. And I think that Simeon and Anna injected that kind of energy into Mary and Joseph. I'd like to finish with a true story, if I may. It's a touching story and it might take me a few minutes to read. It's a story about John Stephen Aquari. There he is. Okay, he was a marathon runner for his country, Tanzania, and in 1968, he entered the men's marathon at the Olympic Games in Mexico City. Don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was never likely to win the men's marathon, but his chances were wrecked when, because of the high altitude he was not used to training in, he succumbed to terrible cramps that racked his body and slowed his progress considerably. 
If that was painful, then worse was to come after he was involved in a melee of athletes jockeying for position. A quarry crashed to the ground, gashing his knee wide open and causing a dislocation as he smashed his shoulder into the pavement. Observers, horrified at his injuries, assumed he would pull out and be taken straight to hospital. Instead, he insisted on receiving medical attention on the track so he could get up and return to the race. His pace was now slowed to just above walking, but his resolve to complete the event remained firmly intact. 18 of the 75 starters had pulled out. He was not going to become 19. And so more than an hour after the winner, in the dark, Tanzania's Akwari crossed the line in the very last place, cheered home by a few thousand spectators who had seen his demise and encouraged by his determination, they remained in the stadium after the sun went down. By the time he reached the stadium, the medals had been awarded, the winners were off for their celebrations. It was quiet in the stadium when John ran in. And when he finished, a news reporter put a microphone in his face and asked him, why did you persevere? How have you carried on in the face of these injuries such difficulty? John Aquari's response has gone down in sporting history. He replied, My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish a marathon. So if we can take something away from Anna, Simeon and John Aquari, I think it's those three habits that I talked to you about. Let's pray. Lord, we just invite you, we invite the Holy Spirit to help us build on these three great spiritual habits that we've heard about today and that we want to put into our lives. Help us to cultivate the habit of trusting in you and all of your promises. Help us, Lord, to act in obedience to your word and at the end in all things to be found to be persevering. So that at the end of our time on earth, we can hear those words from you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for going all the way to the cross for us, for persevering, for trusting in your God to deliver. We don't always know the end and the outcome of our hopes and our dreams, our fears. But Lord, like Jesus, we can persevere to the end knowing that you are a good God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.